Chapter 16 The New Ruler The flyer upon whose deck Dejah Thoris and I found ourselves after twelve long years of separation proved entirely useless. Her buoyancy tanks leaked badly. Her engine would not start. We were helpless there in mid-air above the Arctic ice. The craft had drifted across the chasm which held the corpses of Matai Shang, Thurid, and Fedor, and now hung above a low hill. Opening the buoyancy escape valves, I permitted her to come slowly to the ground, and as she touched, Dejah Thoris and I stepped from her deck, and hand in hand turned back across the frozen waste toward the city of Kadabra. Through the tunnel that had led me in pursuit of them we passed, walking slowly, for we had much to say to each other. She told me of that last terrible moment months before, when the door of her prison cell within the Temple of the Sun was slowly closing between us, of how Fedor had sprung upon her with uplifted dagger, and of Thuvia's shriek as she had realized the foul intention of the Thern goddess. It had been that cry that had rung in my ears all the long weary months that I had been left in cruel doubt as to my princess fate, for I had not known that Thuvia had wrested the blade from the daughter of Matashan before it had touched either Dejah Thoris or herself. She told me, too, of the awful eternity of her imprisonment, of the cruel hatred of Fedor and the tender love of Thuvia, and of how, even when despair was the darkest, those two red girls had clung to the same hope and belief that John Carter would find a way to release them. Presently we came to the chamber of Solon. I had been proceeding without thought of caution, for I was sure that the city and the palace were both in the hands of my friends by this time, and so it was that I bolted into the chamber full into the midst of a dozen nobles of the court of Solensis Old. They were passing through on their way to the outside world along the corridors we had just traversed. At sight of us, they halted in their tracks, and then an ugly smile overspread the features of their leader. The author of all our misfortunes, he cried, pointing at me. We shall have the satisfaction of a partial vengeance, at least, when we leave behind us here the dead and mutilated corpses of the prince and princess of Helium. When they find them, he went on, jerking his thumb upward toward the palace above, they will realize that the vengeance of the yellow man costs his enemies dear. Prepare to die, John Carter, but that your end may be the more bitter. Know that I may change my intention as to meeting a merciful death to your princess. Possibly she shall be preserved as a plaything for my nobles. I stood close to the instrument-covered wall, Dejah Thoris at my side. She looked up at me wonderingly as the warriors advanced upon us with drawn swords, for mine still hung within its scabbard at my side, and there was a smile upon my lips. The yellow nobles, too, looked in surprise, and then, as I made no move to draw, they hesitated, fearing a ruse. But their leader urged them on. When they had come almost within sword's reach of me, I raised my hand and laid it upon the polished surface of a great lever, and then, still smiling grimly, I looked my enemies full in the face. As one, they came to a sudden stop, casting affrighted glances at me and at one another. Stop! shrieked their leader. You dream not what you do! Right you are, I replied. John Carter does not dream. He knows, knows, that should one of you take another step toward Dejah Thoris, Princess of Helium, I pull this lever wide, and she and I shall die together, but we shall not die alone. The nobles shrank back, whispering together for a few moments. At last their leader turned to me. Go your way, John Carter, he said, and we shall go ours. Prisoners do not go their own way, I answered, and you are prisoners, prisoners of the Prince of Helium. Before they could make answer, a door upon the opposite side of the apartment opened, and a score of yellow men poured into the apartment. For an instant, the nobles looked relieved, and then, 
as their eyes fell upon the leader of the new party, their faces fell, for he was Talu, rebel prince of Marantina, and they knew that they could look for neither aid nor mercy at his hands. Well done, John Carter, he cried. You turn their own mighty power against them. Fortunate for Okar is it that you were here to prevent their escape, for these be the greatest villains north of the ice barrier, and this one, pointing to the leader of the party, would have made himself Jeddak of Jeddaks in the place of the dead Silensus old. Then indeed would we have had a more villainous ruler than the hated tyrant who fell before your sword. The Ocarian nobles now submitted to arrest, since nothing but death faced them should they resist, and, escorted by the warriors of Talu, we made our way to the great audience chamber that had been Silensus Olds. Here was a vast concourse of warriors, red men from Helium and Tarth, yellow men of the north, rubbing elbows with the blacks of the firstborn, who had come under my friend Zodar to help in the search for me and my princess. There were savage green warriors from the dead sea bottoms of the south, and a handful of white-skinned therns who had renounced their religion and sworn allegiance to Zodar. There was Tardos Mors and Mors Kajak, and tall and mighty in his gorgeous warrior trappings, Carthoris, my son. These three fell upon Dejah Thoris as we entered the apartment, and though the lives and training of royal Martians tend not toward vulgar demonstration, I thought that they would suffocate her with their embraces. And there were Tars Tarkas, Jeddak of Thark, and Kantos Khan, my old-time friends, and leaping and tearing at my harness in the exuberance of his great love was dear old Wula, frantic mad with happiness. Long and loud was the cheering that burst forth at sight of us. Deafening was the din of ringing metal as the veteran warriors of every Martian clime clashed their blades together on high in token of success and victory. But... As I passed among the throng of saluting nobles and warriors, Jeds and Jeddaks, my heart still was heavy, for there were two faces missing that I would have given much to have seen there. Thuvan Din and Thuvia of Tarth were not to be found in the great chamber. I made inquiries concerning them among men of every nation, and at last, from one of the yellow prisoners of war, I learned that they had been apprehended by an officer of the palace as they sought to reach the pit of plenty while I lay imprisoned there. I did not need to ask to know what had sent them thither, the courageous Jeddak and his loyal daughter. My informer said that they lay now in one of the many buried dungeons of the palace where they had been placed pending a decision as to their fate by the tyrant of the north. A moment later, searching parties were scouring the ancient pile in search of them and my cup of happiness was full when I saw them being escorted into the room by a cheering guard of honor. Thuvia's first act was to rush to the side of Dejah Thoris, and I needed no better proof of the love these two bore for each other than the sincerity with which they embraced. Looking down upon that crowded chamber stood the silent and empty throne of Okar. Of all the strange scenes it must have witnessed since that long-dead age that had first seen a Jeddak of Jeddaks take his seat upon it, none might compare with that upon which it now looked down, and as I pondered the past and future of that long-buried race of black-bearded yellow men, I thought that I saw a brighter and more useful existence for them among the great family of friendly nations that now stretched from the South Pole almost to their very doors. Twenty-two years before, I had been cast naked and a stranger into this strange and savage world. The hand of every race and nation was raised in continual strife and warring against the men of every other land and color. Today, by the might of my sword and the loyalty of the friends my sword had made for me, black man and white, Red man and green rubbed shoulders in peace and good fellowship. All the nations of Barsoom were not yet as one, but a great stride forward toward that goal had been taken. And now, if I could but cement the fierce yellow race into this solidarity of nations, 
I should feel that I had rounded out a great life work, and repaid to Mars at least a portion of the immense debt of gratitude I owed her for having given me my Dejathoris. And as I thought, I saw but one way and a single man who could ensure the success of my hopes. As is ever the way with me, I acted then as I always act, without deliberation and without consultation. Those who do not like my plans and my ways of promoting them have always their swords at their sides wherewith to back up their disapproval. But now there seemed to be no dissenting voice, as, grasping Talu by the arm, I sprang to the throne that had once been Silenza's souls. Warriors of Barsoom, I cried. Kadabra has fallen, and with her the hateful tyrant of the north. But the integrity of Okar must be preserved. The red men are ruled by red Jeddax, the green warriors of the ancient seas acknowledge none but a green ruler. The firstborn of the South Pole take their law from black Zodar. Nor would it be to the interests of either yellow or red man were a red Jeddak to sit upon the throne of Okar. There be but one warrior best fitted for the ancient and mighty title of Jeddak of Jeddaks of the North. Men of Okar, raise your swords to your new ruler, Talu, the rebel prince of Marantina. And then a great cry of rejoicing rose among the free men of Marantina and the Cadabran prisoners, for all had thought that the red men would retain that which they had taken by force of arms, for such had been the way upon Barsoom, and that they should be ruled henceforth by an alien Jeddak. The victorious warriors who had followed Carthoris joined in the mad demonstration, and amidst the wild confusion and the tumult and the cheering, Dejathoris and I passed out into the gorgeous garden of the Jeddaks that graces the inner courtyard of the palace of Kadabra. At our heels walked Wula, and upon a carved seat of wondrous beauty Beneath a bower of purple blooms we saw two who had preceded us, Thuvia of Tarth and Carthoris of Helia. The handsome head of the handsome youth was bent low above the beautiful face of his companion. I looked at Dejathoris, smiling, and as I drew her close to me I whispered, Why not? Indeed, why not? What matter ages in this world of perpetual youth? We remained at Kadabra, the guests of Talu, until after his formal induction into office, and then, upon the great fleet which I had been so fortunate to preserve from destruction, we sailed south across the ice barrier, but not before we had witnessed the total demolition of the grim guardian of the north under orders of the new Jeddak of Jeddaks. Henceforth, he said, as the work was completed, the fleets of the red men and the black are free to come and go across the ice barrier as over their own lands. The carrion cave shall be cleansed that the green men may find an easy way to the land of the yellow. And the hunting of the sacred apt shall be the sport of my nobles until no single specimen of that hideous creature roams the frozen north. We bade our yellow friends farewell with real regret as we set sail for Tarth. There we remained, the guest of Thuvandin, for a month, and I could see that Carthoris would have remained for ever had he not been a prince of Helia. Above the mighty forests of Kao, we hovered until word from Kulan Tith brought us to his single landing tower, where all day and half a night the vessels disembarked their crews. At the city of Kale we visited, cementing the new ties that had been formed between Kale and Helium, and then, one long-to-be-remembered day, we sighted the tall, thin towers of the twin cities of Helium. The people had long been preparing for our coming. The sky was gorgeous with gaily trimmed flyers. Every roof within both cities was spread with costly silks and tapestries. Gold and jewels were scattered over roof and street and plaza, so that the two cities seemed ablaze with the fires of the hearts of the magnificent stones and burnished metal that reflected the brilliant sunlight, changing it into countless glorious hues. At last, after twelve years, 
the royal family of Helium was reunited in their own mighty city, surrounded by joy-mad millions before the palace gates. Women and children and mighty warriors wept in gratitude for the fate that had restored their beloved Tardis Moors and the divine princess whom the whole nation idolized. Nor did any of us who had been upon that expedition of indescribable danger and glory lack for plaudits. That night a messenger came to me as I sat with Dejathoris and Cartharis upon the roof of my city palace, where we had long since caused a lovely garden to be made that we three might find seclusion and quiet happiness among ourselves, far from the pomp and ceremony of court, to summon us to the temple of reward, where one is to be judged this night, the summons concluded. I racked my brain to try and determine what important case there might be pending, which could call the royal family from their palaces on the eve of their return to Helium after years of absence. But when the Jeddak summons, no man delays. As our flyer touched the landing stage at the temple's top, we saw countless other craft arriving and departing. In the streets below, a great multitude surged toward the great gates of the temple. Slowly there came to me the recollection of the deferred doom that awaited me, since that time I had been tried here in the temple of Zataris for the sin of returning from the valley door in the lost sea of Chorus. Could it be possible that the strict sense of justice which dominates the men of Mars had caused them to overlook the great good that had come out of my heresy? Could they ignore the fact that to me and me alone was due the rescue of Carthoris, of Dejathoris, of Moors Kajak, of Tartus Moors? I could not believe it, and yet, for what other purpose could I have been summoned to the Temple of Reward immediately upon the return of Tartus Moors to his throne? My first surprise as I entered the temple and approached the throne of righteousness was to note the men who sat there as judges. There was Kulan Tith, Jeddak of Kael, whom we had but just left within his own palace a few days since. There was Thuvan Din, Jeddak of Tarth. How came he to Helium as soon as we? There was Tars Tarkas, Jeddak of Thark, and Zodar, Jeddak of the Firstborn. There was Talu, Jeddak of Jeddaks of the North, whom I could have sworn was still in his ice-bound hothouse city beyond the northern barrier. And among them sat Tardos Moors and Moors Kajak, with enough lesser Jeds and Jeddaks to make up the thirty-one who must sit in judgment upon their fellow man. A right royal tribunal indeed, and such a one I warrant as never before sat together during all the history of ancient Mars. As I entered, silence fell upon the great concourse of people that packed the auditorium. Then Tardos Moors arose. John Carter, he said in his deep martial voice, take your place upon the pedestal of truth, for you are to be tried by the fair and impartial tribunal of your fellow men. With level eye and high-held head I did as he bade and as I glanced about that circle of faces that a moment before I could have sworn contained the best friends I had upon Barzoom, I saw no single friendly glance, only stern, uncompromising judges there to do their duty. A clerk rose, and from a great book read a long list of the more notable deeds that I had thought to my credit, covering a long period of twenty-two years since first I had stepped the ochre sea bottom beside the incubator of the Tharks. With the others, he read of all that I had done within the circle of the Oats Mountains, where the Holy Therns and the Firstborn had held sway. It is the way upon Barsoom to recite a man's virtues with his sins when he has come to trial, and so I was not surprised that all that was to my credit should be read there to my judges, who knew it all by heart, even down to the present moment. When the reading had ceased, Tardos Moors arose. Most righteous judges, he exclaimed, you have heard recited all that is known of John Carter, Prince of Helium, the good with the bad. What is your judgment? Then Tars Tarkas came slowly to his feet, 
unfolding all his mighty, towering height, until he loomed a green bronze statue far above us all. He turned a baleful eye upon me. He, Tars Tarkas, with whom I had fought through countless battles, whom I loved as a brother. I could have wept had I not been so mad with rage that I almost whipped my sword out and had at them all on the spot. Judges, he said, there can be but one verdict. No longer may John Carter be Prince of Helium, he paused. But instead, let him be Jeddak of Jeddaks, warlord of Barsoom. As the thirty-one judges sprang to their feet with drawn and upraised swords in unanimous concurrence in the verdict, the storm broke throughout the length and breadth and height of that mighty building, until I thought the roof would fall from the thunder of the mad shouting. Now at last I saw the grim humor of the method they had adopted to do me this great honor, but that there was any hoax in the reality of the title they had conferred upon me was readily disproved by the sincerity of the congratulations that were heaped upon me by the judges first and then the nobles. Presently fifty of the mightiest nobles of the greatest courts of Mars marched down the broad Isle of Hope, bearing a splendid car upon their shoulders, and as the people saw who sat within, the cheers that had rung out for me paled into insignificance beside those which thundered through the vast edifice now, for she whom the nobles carried was Dejah Thoris, beloved princess of Helium. Straight to the throne of righteousness they bore her, and there Tardos Mors assisted her from the car, leading her forward to my side. Let a world's most beautiful woman share the honor of her husband, he said. Before them all I drew my wife close to me and kissed her upon the lips. End of chapter 16 Recording by Thomas Copeland End of The Warlord of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs